Hi, I'm Mike Landy. I'm a professor in the psychology department in the cognition and perception program. And in fact, am the coordinator of that program, which means among other things, I administer PhD admissions. My lab works on perception and action. Uh, and this is my lab, my two postdocs at current times, my three current graduate students and six MA and undergraduate students who do research with us. My lab works on perception and action and works on a diverse uh, areas of research, including spatial vision, 3D or depth perception, uh, sensory cue integration when you combine more than one cue to some uh, perceptual task, perceptual decision making, uh, vision and action, so how vision is used to guide eye and hand movements. And we study all of those things with behavioral experiments or psychophysics, with computational models to understand the computations underlying those behaviors. And we also look at how the brain implements those behaviors using functional MRI. I'm gonna talk about three studies today. The first one on 3D motion carried out by Puti Wen, one of my graduate students. She in fact is an NYU Abu Dhabi graduate student, which means that she works in my lab in New York for a couple of years, and then continues on with our collaborator, Boss Rokers, in his lab at NYU Abu Dhabi. Now, 3D motion is obviously important for many different tasks, as illustrated here. Now, how does 3D motion work? Well, if something's moving straight towards you, it's moving to the right in your left eye and to the left in your right eye, so that 3D motion involves comparison, comparing the velocities of motion in your two eyes. Motion away from you would be the opposite of this. Motion rightward would be rightward in both eyes, et cetera. So to study this, we have people look at a motion display uh, where they're looking at one of eight different directions of motion towards away, rightward, leftward, right and away, left and towards, et cetera. And while they're looking at those directions of motion, we're recording their brain activity using functional MRI. And the question is, where in the brain is there information about the 3D direction of motion? And we look at that by trying to decode what's on the screen based on the brain responses that we measure. And we ask questions like, where in the brain can we decode 3D motion direction? And for well-known delineated subregions of the cortex, which ones are best at our ability to decode what's on the screen from the responses there, suggesting that they may contain really good information for uh, analyzing 3D motion. And in fact, there are lots of areas in the brain here. We're looking at the back halves of the uh, two, two halves of the brain, and we see above average decoding performance in lots and lots of brain regions as shown there in color. Below, we show that there's above chance performance where chance is guessing one in eight, so above chance performance in lots of uh, typical delineated regions, including in the middle there, HMT, which is an area that's often described as, as uh, specifically uh, analyzing motion. So that's one area we're working on. Second study, sensory motor confidence. So Marissa Evans is a first year graduate student in my lab, and she's working on vision and action. And in particular, after a reach, how confident are you in the quality of that reach, i.e. whether it landed on or near the target that you were aiming at? This is important because after a reach, you might want to know how well it worked out to know whether you should repeat it, whether you should practice it, whether you, whether you should deal with the consequences of missing the target you were aiming at. Now, most of the field of metacognition looks at confidence judgments in perceptual or cognitive judgments that are typically binary decisions. Was it there or not? Was it clockwise or counterclockwise. Whereas a motor response is a continuous uh, response and has a continuous valued error. And so that makes this quite a different kind of a judgment qualitatively than what most of the field has studied. Now to do this, here's the setup. Uh, you're making a reach on a trackpad using a stylus, but you can't see your arm because there's a mirror in the way. On the mirror, we can project various images using an LCD projector. So we may project a place to move your hand to and your hand, and when your hand gets there, we'll stop giving you feedback of your hand. We'll project a target. You then reach towards the target. You don't get to see your reach. You may feel it proprioceptively, but you can't see it. You then return to where you start, and then a circle shows up centered on where the target was, and you make your confidence judgment 
by varying its size so as to just barely include where you think your reach ended up. We incentivize the size of that circle by giving you points for where you set it. So if you make it so small, it doesn't include your endpoint, you get no points. If it includes your endpoint, you'll get points, but the bigger you make it, the fewer points you will earn and points will turn into money. So you're incentivized to make the circle as small as possible such that it includes where you ended up. These data are currently being collected by Marissa and being analyzed and modeled. So for the final study I'll tell you about, I'm gonna talk about the effects of attention on ventriloquism. This was a study by Steph Bata, who is a postdoc with me, now a professor at Tufts, and Karen Navarro, who at the time was an undergraduate at City College, and now is a PhD student at the University of Minneapolis. So we all know what ventriloquism is. In ventriloquism, the guy on the right is talking, but his lips aren't moving, but he's controlling the dummy on the left in sync with his talking, and moving the dummy's mouth. And you perceive the sound, which is coming from the guy, as coming from the dummy because of the visual stimulus. So you displace where you perceive sound coming from because of this setup. Now that's the ventriloquism effect. The ventriloquism after effect is if you uh, sit in this situation with displaced, displaced perception of audition for say 20 minutes, and then afterwards I play you a sound and ask you to point at it, in this situation, you might point to the left of where it's actually coming from, consistent with the displacement you were perceiving when you were watching the ventriloquist. Now, what's cool is that this not only works for vision and audition, it also works for vision and touch. And we study that with this fun apparatus that we have Velcroed to your arm that has seven little buzzers like you have in your cell phone at different places along your forearm and co-located seven different LEDs that can flash. So you can get buzzes on your skin, flashes, both in the same location, in different locations, and we can use that to study this effect. So in the experiment, we're gonna study the effect of attention on the ventriloquist effect. So we're gonna either show you a flash, show you a buzz, show you both co-located or not. And we're gonna ask you to localize one of them. And we may ask you, which modality in advance of the stimulus, in which case you can ignore the other stimulus, or we may tell you which modality to report after the stimulus, in which case you are forced to attend to both of them. And so that's, that's the attention manipulation. Then you'll localize the modality I asked you to localize. And finally, you'll make a binary choice of whether you thought the two stimuli were co-located, i.e. came from the same source or not. Here are the data. On the bottom, we'll concentrate on those. Those are the tactile localizations. And you see, as you go from left to right, the slope of the curves gets steeper uh, so that when you're forced to attend to both stimuli, you localize the tactile stimulus closer and closer to the visual stimulus, which is to say the ventriloquism effect gets stronger with bisensory attention. Also on the right is two curves, one solid, that's when you didn't think they came from the same store, source and won the open symbols. That's when you thought they came from a common source and there the ventriloquism effect is even stronger. Not only that, attending to both stimuli made you much, much more likely to say that the two stimuli came from the same source and the same location. Now, so we get stronger and stronger integration with bisensory attention and the question is why? To answer that question, we need a computational model. So computational models are quite complex. I won't go into the details here. I'll just jump to the results. We fit a computational model to the data I just showed you. And what we find is that when you attend to both modalities, the measurement of the visual location becomes noisier because you split your attention across two modalities. The measurement of the tactile localization becomes noisier, that's in the middle panel. And finally, your prior assumption of whether it's likely that the two stimuli would come from a common source increases hugely in bisensory attention. So you tend to glue the two stimuli together when you attend to both of them. Thank you.